Hello and welcome. I'm Dr. Deepak Bhatt. It's really great to have you here on behalf of CME Outfitters. I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity titled Weighing the Evidence, a Pharmacy Approach to Stroke Prevention in Obese Patients with Non-Valvular Atrial Fibrillation. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. As I mentioned, I'm Dr. Deepak Bhatt, Executive Director of Interventional Cardiovascular Programs at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Let me introduce our faculty joining me today. It's really some great faculty. I'd like to welcome my colleague, Dr. Edith Nitescu, who is the Professor and Head of the Department of Pharmacy Practice and Michael Reese Endowed Professor of Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And she's at the College of Pharmacy there in Chicago, Illinois. I've known her for a while and I'm really lucky to have her here. Welcome, Edith. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt. It is a true pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to interacting with all of you uh, tonight. Yeah, I think it's gonna be fun. I'd also like to introduce my colleague, Kazuhiko Kido. And Dr. Keto is Clinical Assistant Professor of Clinical Pharmacy at West Virginia University School of Pharmacy in Morgantown, West Virginia. I love Morgantown. I've been there many oh, times. Welcome, Kazu. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bart. And I'm also excited to be here to share the, some new upcoming information regarding the morbid obese patients using the anticoagulation for the populations. Thank you for inviting me today. Yeah, great to have you and your insights and wisdom. So let me review our learning objectives. Our first learning objective is to assess existing guidelines and US prescribing information for use of non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants, or NOACs, you hear us call them, and warfarin to prevent stroke in obese patients with non-valvular AF, or atrial fibrillation. Our second learning objective is to evaluate safety and efficacy data for NOACs and warfarin in obese patients with non-valvular non AF. And our final learning objective is to counsel obese patients with non-valvular AF on risks and benefits of NOACs and warfarin to optimize adherence and health outcomes. So I wanna start by getting all of you in the audience involved here in considering a case study. And then I'm gonna ask a question about it. So uh, please pay attention. So we have here a 63 year old female presenting to the hospital for new onset atrial fibrillation. As you can see, she's clutching her chest. Uh, her past medical history includes hypertension and diabetes. The weight is 130 kilograms, but more importantly, the body mass index is high, 45 kilograms per meter squared. Her vitals, blood pressure 130 or 85, heart rate 90, respiration is 22, temperature of 36.5. She's currently on 81 a day of aspirin, lisinopril 10 milligrams a day, metformin 500 milligrams twice daily. She has no known allergies. And all the labs that we've got, at least on this initial screen, are within the normal range. So let's go ahead now and see what you think. This is the audience response part of things. You get to vote. So the question is, which anticoagulant would you personally recommend for this patient? And the options are shown on your screen. A for warfarin, B for pixaban, C for roxaban, D for dibigatran, E for doxaban, or F for I don't know. So please go ahead and vote. And perhaps while the audience is thinking and voting and cogitating and so forth, maybe I'll just turn to my esteemed co-faculty and say, uh, you know, get your uh, minds in gear, think of what you think the right answer is because when we see the answers from the audience, I'm gonna ask both of you to opine. All right, so let me turn to the faculty. Maybe Edith, we'll start with you. Uh, what would you say is the right answer here? So in this uh, case, uh, several factors would have to be considered. Of course, Dr. Bad, as you highlighted, the patient's weight, uh, the patient has a BMI of 45, um, concurrent therapy, um, important to note, um, aspirin, um, of course, the indication for therapy here and the risk uh, for stroke. And so in this case, um, 
given um, the patient characteristics, the risk of stroke, um, I would go with a Pixabam and later in the presentation, we'll see why that is. And so um, what is the data behind uh, one of the NOACs versus more traditional options such as warfarin? And Kasu, do you have any differing opinion? Yeah, I agree with the Dr. Nutescu. So probably the, you know, the NOAC would be, you know, appropriate based on the upcoming result we're going to talk about today. But if you follow the ISTH statement specifically that we're going to talk about, probably warfarin is also appropriate. So we're going to talk about the case by case approach to see which agent would be better for these patients. Terrific. Well, so some room for discussion and learning for all of us. So let me start now by addressing the topic of obesity and atrial fibrillation. That's an important topic for sure. So the numbers are shown on this slide, 35 to 40% of adults in the US are living with obesity. It's an independent risk factor for atrial fibrillation. You know, that's not so commonly appreciated, I think, by folks out there, but the data really do support that. And it frequently coexists with other AF risk factors, including hypertension, type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease. These things often move in packs. Obesity accounts for about one in five of all AF cases. Risk is increased by about 3% to 7% per incremental BMI unit. And obesity results in atrial remodeling, increased atrial size, interstitial fibrosis, pericardial fat, fat infiltration into atrial myocardium, and herogenous and slow conduction. Well, after seeing that, I don't feel like eating dinner anymore. So the epidemiology of atrial fibrillation in the US is shown here, but the bottom line is there is a rising prevalence. As of 2010, going back a decade, prevalence estimates for AF in the US range from about 2.7 million to 6.1 million. And the AF prevalence is predicted to increase by up to twofold by 2030 to about 12.1 million. And I, I think that's actually quite an underestimate. There's probably gonna be even more between the aging of the population and growth in the population and other sorts of trends, there's gonna be a lot of AF. So as far as the clinical presentations of atrial fibrillation, there are lots of them and they're shown here. Uh, lightheadedness, palpitations, syncope, dyspnea, fatigue, chest pain, thromboembolism, death. That's a particularly bad clinical presentation. But as it turns out, people with atrial fibrillation actually do have a higher risk of sudden cardiac death as well, among all the other problems that are associated with atrial fibrillation. It's important to realize though that atrial fibrillation can be asymptomatic and the impact of asymptomatic atrial fibrillation is the potential for underlying electrical and structural change damage to the atrial myocardium. And while AF symptoms alone may not always be severe, untreated disease can also result in significant morbidity and mortality like stroke. So shown here is the cumulative incidence of cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke after atrial fibrillation. These are data from the International Reach Registry, but there are other registries and data sets that basically show the same thing. And you can see here the much higher rate of ischemic events, not just stroke, but also MI and also CV death in those with atrial fibrillation in their history versus those without. Now, some of this is directly causal, as in stroke and that's non-fatal or fatal stroke. Uh, some of it is sort of uh, epiphenomenon. That is the MI risk is largely due to the shared risk factors for both atrial fibrillation, myocardial infarction, things like I mentioned already, things like obesity and diabetes. You know, it's a controversial question out there. How much AF do you need to increase the risk of stroke? This slide, I think, nicely summarizes the data going back a bit in time in terms of how long you might have AFib or your patients might have AFib and what the hazard ratio is for stroke. So even five minutes of atrial fibrillation is associated with, oh, about a two to six or more fold excess risk of stroke. So even a short period is associated with a higher risk of stroke. And certainly, if it's been present for more than a day or so, the risk of stroke, uh, as everyone I think knows, uh, goes up quite substantially. Exactly where that transition point occurs still is a matter of a bit of debate. And more importantly, when it should be a threshold for therapy, uh, that is for anticoagulation, 
is also something that is a bit up in the air and a source of lots of ongoing studies. It's important to risk stratify for stroke and atrial fibrillation. We used to do this with the CHADS score, but now that has been eclipsed by the CHADS VASC score. And you can see there with the older CHADS or the more recent CHADS VASC, the higher the risk score, the greater the annual risk of ischemic stroke. And let's just focus on CHADS VASC in orange there. You can see the more risk factors, the risk of stroke really does go up, but it does actually go up even with a CHADS VASC of one. So really anything at one or higher, I think is uh, worth at least uh, considering treatment for. We'll get into things like guidelines or some difference between the, the US and the European guidelines, but before drowning in guidelines, just take a look at these numbers here. So yeah, obviously Chad's VASC of you know, two, three, four is worse than one, but uh, one is no free lunch either. There's also the potential for risk stratifying based on bleeding risk scores. And HASBLED is one of those. You can see there the different points that go into the categorization or compilation of HASBLED. And uh, I think it's useful to at least be aware of these risk factors for bleeding and think about them. Things like abnormal liver or renal function, everybody I believe intuitively knows those things raise the risk of bleeding. Obviously, if someone's had a stroke, that can raise the risk of bleeding, in particular intracranial bleeding, but even other bleeding because of the other associated risk factors that go along with having had a stroke. Prior bleeding is a good predictor of future bleeding for folks on warfarin, a label INR, that can spell trouble. Older patients are, of course, at high risk of bleeding. And if you're throwing in drugs or alcohol, that certainly can raise the risk of bleeding. There are other scores out there for bleeding, the hemorrhages, atria, or orbit scores as well. There are other ways of doing it. I must say, I'm not convinced that any of the bleeding risk scores really are in common use, but it is at a minimum worthwhile thinking about those things that lead to a high bleeding risk score. And here are the 2019 ACC AHA HRS guidelines for atrial fibrillation. Everything listed here is a level one recommendation, meaning you ought to do it. The levels of evidence might vary a little bit, but the class one recommendation means you really ought to be doing these things. So let me just quickly go through these for patients with AF and a chas vas score greater than or equal to two in men or greater than or equal to three in women, oral anticoagulants are recommended. Options include warfarin, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, or doxaban. And as I mentioned, you know, I might have a slightly different uh, views with respect to Chad's VASC uh, that are lower in both men and one, but we can, uh, dis uh, we can discuss that later. But, but I think even at one, men and women, um, if they're at low bleeding risk, uh, certainly may benefit from anticoagulation in particular with a NOAC if they're a good candidate for that. But uh, speaking of NOACs, uh, dobigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban are recommended over warfarin in NOAC eligible patients with AF. So uh, modern medicine actually prefers NOACs to warfarin in AF, except if they've got moderate to severe mitral stenosis. And of course, if they got a mechanical heart valve, warfarin and an INR range that is appropriate for that valve still remains the standard of care. Among patients on warfarin, the INR should be determined at least weekly during initiation and at least monthly when it is in a stable range. In patients with AF, except uh, the two situations I mentioned before with respect to mitral stenosis and mechanical heart valves, the chads vas score is recommended for assessment of stroke risk. For patients with AF who have mechanical heart valves, their warfarin is recommended. Selection of anticoagulant therapy should be based on the risk of thromboembolism, irrespective of whether the AF pattern is paroxysmal, persistent, or permanent. That's really old fashioned thinking where we used to say, oh, it's just a little bit of paroxysmal AF. The risk of stroke shouldn't be too bad. It's not permanent AF. That thinking is clearly wrong. Renal function and hepatic function should be evaluated before initiation of a NOAC and should be reevaluated at least annually. Of course, in some patients, especially when using NOACs, you wanna be aware if they've got fluctuating renal function, especially if they're on the lower range of the GFR to begin with, uh, because there might need to be dosage or other adjustments. 
All right, well, now, Edith, can you take us through an overview of the current NOACs we have available for stroke prevention in patients with non-valvular AF? Absolutely, and so on this slide, um, what you see is an overview of the four um, NOACs uh, currently approved in the US for stroke prevention in AF patients. Um, the first column uh, highlights some of the key characteristics of the four agents uh, listed here, the bigatran, rivaroxaban, opixaban, ledoxaban. And so, of course, uh, three of these are factor 10A inhibitors, but the bigger trend being a direct thrombin inhibitor. Uh, two of the agents as highlighted here are dosed once a day. Uh, two uh, agents, the bigger trend and apixabam, are dosed twice a day. The uh, peak to onset, um, or, or time to onset, I should say, um, and time to reach peak effect is uh, rather quick, and it ranges anywhere from one to uh, one to three hours with apixabam up to about two to four hours with rivaroxaban. Half-lives are also listed uh, here. You could see the shorter half-life, five to nine hours with rivaroxaban, and then a bit longer, up to 14, 17 hours with the bigatran. In terms of renal clearance, uh, the um, NOAC that's, that has um, highest percent of renal dependency is the bigatran, about 80%, um, about one third, around 30% or so with apixabam and rivaroxaban, and a doxabam about 50%. Drug drug, drug drug interactions, um, all of them um, interact with PGP inducers um, or inhibitors. And then of course, rivaroxabam, apixabam uh, can also have interactions with CYP384 um, uh, medications that are metabolized through this enzyme system. Uh, in terms of effect of food, um, rivaroxabam um, has to be taken with the evening meal in terms of better um, bioavailability um, uh, that results from taking with food, um, but food has no effect on the other three. And of course, when we look at the status of um, an available reversal agent, um, rivaroxabam or pixabam have a dexanet alpha and I, either suzumab for the bigatran. Now, next, I'd like to review with you um, renal dosing adjustments in um, AF patients with the four agents. Again, you see the um, creatinine clearance listed in the first column and dosing adjustment recommendations with the four agents. Um, Apixabam, no dose, no uh, adjustment, um, uh, dose adjustment is recommended based on creatinine clearance specifically. Uh, however, uh, a dose decrease is recommended for patients that have two or more of the fo following characteristics, such as age equal or uh, greater than 80 years, uh, body weight less uh, than or equal to 60 kilograms, and a serum, serum creatinine of one and a half or higher. Otherwise, the dosing, of course, you see here as listed as five milligram twice a day. Now with the other three agents, um, if the clearance is uh, less than 15 or the patient is on dialysis, these agents are not recommended to be used. And then um, for some of the agents for the uh, clearance range of 30 to 50, um, such as Zaxaban, for instance, you see a dose uh, decrease recommendation and 15 to 30 for the Bigatran um, and 30 to 50 for Rivaroxaban. So this in a nutshell, uh, very quickly is a, a peak and a rapid overview of what we would do uh, in terms of renal dosing um, in AF patients. Uh, next, I would like to also briefly review um, some considerations in terms of hepatic disease. And so in those patients with um, uh, child puke class A, as you could see here, no, no dose adjustment required. Those with class C, um, the 10 A's are not recommended. Um, interestingly, um, for class, for the bigger trend, no dose adjustment required, but when we look at class B, what we're seeing is a fairly large intersubject variability um, and, and no, um, interestingly, no evidence of a consistent change of exposure in pharmacodynamics. Um, 
Rivaroxabam, Edoxabam um, in class B are not recommended. And with Apixabam, um, um, the label recommends use with caution only, but uh, specific recommendations on how you know, we would use this with caution are not provided. Um, I think my next slide focuses on drug interactions. Yes, so I wanted to also briefly review with you some key highlights in terms of drug interactions. And so all of the agents uh, would have to be avoided um, with um, PGP inducers such as rifampin. Um, and then looking at the specific agents, some things I would like to highlight, for instance, um, for uh, the bigotran um, with PGP inhibitors, um, if the clearance is 30 to 50, we would reduce the dose and a clearance of 30, we would not use the agent. In terms of combined PGP and strong 3-4 inhibitors, um, agents such as ketoconazole, itroconazole, ritonavir, um, we would avoid the use of rivaroxabam. And uh, for apixabam, for instance, we would reduce the dose by 50% if the patients receive a dose of 5 or 10 milligram. Uh, but if the patient already is receiving a reduced dose of 2.5 milligram, then in that case, avoiding apixabam is um, recommended. One other uh, thing I would like to highlight here is uh, for combined PGP and moderate 3 for an inhibitor such as erythromycin, diltiazem also fits this category. Um, for rivaroxabam, um, the recommendation is not to use in patients who have a clearance of 15 to 8. 80 mLs per minute, unless potential benefit justifies potential risk. So this is um, because of the increased concern of drug accumulation, rivaroxabam accumulation, and, and potentially heightened risk of bleeding in patients that would take a combined PGP and moderate 3 4 uh, inhibitor. Well, thanks, Edith. That was extremely useful. I want to now myself shift to show some of the data on efficacy and safety of the current NOACs and how they compare to warfarin. So let's shift gears a little bit to do that. So here is a meta-analysis of four phase three trials looking at stroke and systemic embolism type events. And what you see here is that NOACs are better than warfarin. I would say that that is true in the individual trials and certainly now pooling all the data as was done by, by my colleague here at the Brigham, Christian Roth, that there is a statistically significant reduction in these events in favor of NOACs. So really, this is what I think serves as our basis for preferring NOACs over warfarin. That was the efficacy side of the equation. What about the bleeding side of the equation? Well, in general, in these trials, the NOACs looked either similar to or better than warfarin with respect to major bleeding when we lump all types of major bleeding together, such that in the meta-analysis, once more, the NOACs win over warfarin. And one can quibble about specific p-values and such, but I'd say as a class, this is true, uh, though it was a bit more robust uh, in the individual trials when one looked at Aristotle and Engage AF. I should point out for intracranial hemorrhage, it was a clear-cut win, about a 10% reduction that was seen in that meta-analysis and was consistent across trials as well. So, you know, here's major bleeding, but the intracranial hemorrhage part of things, you know, there, there's no real discussion or ambiguity, strong win for no acts over warfarin. An issue, however, because of fears of bleeding with warfarin that have transferred over now to fears of bleeding with no acts is underdosing. The intent comes from a good place and general doctors are wanting to prevent bleeding and other complications and therefore using logic, figure, okay, this patient's older, they're at higher bleeding risk, and therefore I'm gonna use less NOAC so that they'll have less bleeding. Again, well-intentioned, makes sense, but unfortunately the wrong thing to do in most cases. Uh, and in a sample of about 13,000 patients in the US with no renal indication for dose reduction, approximately 13% still received a dose reduction. And it was most common in the sort of patient I mentioned, somebody over 80, but also in those folks with a CHADS VAS score greater than or equal to four. So folks that would benefit the most, in fact, from being on a NOAC or on anticoagulation in general. And of course, patients that were high bleeding risk or also often at high stroke risk were ones where there was less utilization. 
And uh, you know, there have been similar studies of 8,000 patients in a study from Israel, for example, basically showing, again, a large percentage, in that case, 39% receiving off-label dose reduced treatment. So if the label says to reduce the dose, such as for issues of renal function or, or other reasons, well, follow the label. The labels are based on good data. But if the label doesn't say to reduce it, when you reduce it, then the patient doesn't get the benefit, but is still exposed to some sort of bleeding risk. And that's what the data at the bottom says in terms of uh, potentially losing some of the benefit on thromboembolic complications, but still having bleeding hazard from that approach. Here we see the efficacy and safety of NOAX versus warfarin in patients with moderate CKD. And the point here is even in those patients with some degree of renal dysfunction, a moderate degree of renal dysfunction, it does appear from what data we have, realizing that there's not a ton of data in general in patients with CKD, that NOAX still emerge as the winner. Certainly not worse than warfarin in any case, but in many cases, with respect to efficacy better and bleeding at least not worse and depending on the trial perhaps even better. So even in patients with moderate CKD, respecting the label, dose adjusting if appropriate, it does seem like no acts are the way to go over and above warfarin. All right, well, you know, I've pretty much gone through some of the data with respect to the issues of renal dysfunction and other sorts of things that come up frequently. Uh, now I want to shift gears a little bit, or actually have Kazu shift gears a little bit, and speak what our main theme about tonight was really focused on, and that is patients with obesity. We've discussed some of the other challenges and things that really everyone using NOAX needs to know about in the non valgary AF population thinking about hepatic dysfunction, renal dysfunction, underdosing, et cetera. But what about patients that are obese? There are a growing number of patients. What do we do with these patients? And to gain insight on that, let me hand over the floor to Kazu. Thank you, Dr. Bart. And I'm glad to share some upcoming results. But before we move on to the actual study data, let me start with the obesity paradox. So what is the obesity paradox? So Theoretically, the, we expected that obesity was associated with higher risk of cardiovascular death, cardiovascular disease, or all-cause mortality. However, the actual study data shows that obesity status was associated with the reduction of the stroke or systemic embolism all-cause mortality or cardiovascular death. So there is the conflicting things between the theory and the actual data. So this is called the obesity paradox. So what kind of the data supports the obesity paradox theory? So here is the meta-analysis that show including the patients on including the studies of the Aristro trials, which is the Pixaben versus the Wolfrin and the Rocket AF trial, uh, including the Rivaroxaban versus the Wolfrin and the Relayer trial, which is the, uh, the bigger term versus the Wolfrin. And then these meta-analysis compiled all of the uh, data into the meta-analysis format. And then for the stroke or systemic embolism in the upper side and the lower side is for the major bleeding. And then this meta-analysis showed that the obese patient was associated with significantly lower rate of stroke or systemic embolism compared to the normal weight patients. The, based on the odd ratio 0.62 and 95% confidence interval did not cross one. And then moving on to the major bleeding and compared to the normal weight patients, the obese patient was associated with significantly lower rate of major bleeding compared to the normal weight patients. So this meta-analysis supports the theory of the obesity paradox. So having said that, ISTH International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis statement came out in 2016. And then the st statement recommended the use of warfarin over NOAX in for, for mobile obese patients with BMI greater than 40, 
or weight greater than 120 based on the two big reasons. One reason was the limited clinical evidence available at the time. And then the other rationale for this statement was the PK pharmacokinetic variations in the NOAX based on the weight that some study shows. So therefore the statement also recommended that if the NOACs are selected for the morbid obese patients, that checking trough and the peak levels are suggested. And then if the levels within the expected range, then NOACs continuation will be recommended versus that if the levels goes below the expected range, the warfarin was recommended. So is this true or do we need to follow the ISTH statement for all of the morbidly obese patients or do we need to take a case by case approach that to individualize anticoagulation therapy for morbid obese patients? So since March 2016 to the December 2020, time flies by, but it's almost, it's been four years since the ISTH statement came by. And then since then, the multiple study came out to evaluate the efficacy and the safety of the NOAX in the morbid obese patients with atrial fibrillations or venous thromboembolism. Therefore, that do we need to, that we need to evaluate those to assess. Do we need to follow the ISTH statement for all patients or we could use NOAC based on these trial came out over the last four years. So before moving on to the clinical studies, let me introduce the pharmacokinetic studies in the morbid obese patients. So here are two single dose pharmacokinetic studies. On the left side, rivaroxaban single dose study versus on the right side, the pixaban single dose pharmacokinetic studies. And then rivaroxaban single dose pharmacokinetic study included the three cohort uh, based on the weights, the less than or equal to 50 kilo, 70 to 80 kilo, which was the reference group versus the morbidly obese patient greater than 120 kilo. And then studies show that um, the morbid obese patients group and the reference groups had a similar CMAX value and also area under the curve values. And then study also showed that the rivaroxaban the calibrated anti tain activity was similar in all three weight groups. So therefore the study concluded that there was no significant differences in the PK profile among the weights. Then moving on to the Pixaban single dose. So this study included the 54 healthy subject looking at the three different cohorts based on the weight, less than 50 kilo, 65 to 85 kilo, which was the reference range, and then the morbidity of these patients. And then compared with the reference group, the actually the patient, morbid obese patient had a 31% lower CMAX and a 23% lower area under the curve. So that means that so there is some PK variation among NOACs, especially the Pixaban had some the PK variations. So that to put all this information together, that there may be the PK variations. So the PK profiles in the morbid obesity patient will be the NOAC specific. So there is a concern. So therefore that we may need to suggest monitoring the NOAX level. So what are the NOAX levels? So let me explain the NOAX intensity and the levels. So the intensity means the qualitative assessment versus the NOAX level means a quantitative assessment. For, do, for the bigger trends, we could use the APTT or thrombin time for intensity, which means that the finding the presence of the medication in the system but it does not measure the levels. Versus the four levels for the bigger trends that we could use the diluted thrombin time and the echoing chromogenic assay or echoing clotting time. And if the levels is in the lower range, liquid chromatography or mass spectrometry could be used to measure the lower level accurately. And then for the anti tain inhibitor, pixaban, rivaroxaban, or edoxaban, the prothrombin time for the pixaban may not be recommended due to the lower sensitivity, versus the rivaroxaban and doxaban, the prothrombin time may be used to detect the presence of the medications in the system. The versus the, for the level for quantitative assessment, chromogenic anti tain assays are used to measure the levels. And if the levels is in the lower range, the liquid chromatography or mass spectrometry may be used to measure the levels accurately. However, the, due to the availability, in general, the chromogenic anti-TNA assays are the most common way to measure the levels. 
So what are the actual, the NOx level ranges? So here is the uh, data from the Sam Elson and the colleagues in the chest journal, the systematic review showing that the expected steady state ranges. So here I wanna highlight that these are the expected state, uh, steady state ranges, not the therapeutic range. So we expect if the patient received the standard, standard dosing of the NOx, that we expect the patients to have these ranges. So considering those information, so what are the actual NOAC pharmacokinetic studies available in the morbid obese patients in the real world setting? So over the last 12 months, there were two studies came out to illustrate the effect of the NOAC in in a, in a no mobile obese patient from the pharmacokinetic perspective. So the first study was the, conducted by Martin and the colleagues, the prospective observational study, including the, using the Pixabans or Rivaroxaban standard dose for the AFib or venous thromboembolism patients. The 116 samples were included. And then cohort mean body weight was 139 kilo and the mean the body mass index was 45 and the 84% was morbidly obese patients. So it means majority were morbidly obese. And then the study showed that, that there was no linear relationship between the trough or peak anti tear levels and the body weight or body mass index. So that study concluded that, uh, you know, the body weight or B body mass index did not affect the PK profiles of the peak events or rivaroxabans. And then moving on to the uh, another studies conducted by Speed and the colleagues, the pharmacokinetic analysis, population pharmacokinetic analysis, looking at the use of the rivaroxaban in the morbid obese patients and the normal weight patients. And the 913 patients were included from the 39 to the 172 kilogram of the weight and opportunistic samplings was used and a non mem software was used for the population of pharmacokinetics. And then the data shows that the two pharmacokinetic parameters, the clearance and the volume of distributions were influenced just by the lean body weight and then total body weight and then BMI had minimal influence on the rivaroxaban PK parameters. So that means that the lean body weight is difference between total body weight and the fatty mass. So the larger fatty mass did not affect the PK profile. So that also supports the use of the rivaroxabans in the morbid obese patients um, based on the, these pharmacokinetic studies. So to put all these studies, uh, pharmacokinetic studies together, so that from the pharmacokinetic perspective, the use of the NOAX may be supported over the wolf, uh, the, in the mobile obese patients. Well, thank you very much, Kazu. Just to sum up what we've discussed so far, let me just make a few points here. Reducing stroke risk in patients with atrial fibrillation is essential, regardless of whether a patient's symptomatic or asymptomatic. NOACs are generally recommended as first-line therapy for stroke prevention in non-valvular AF. And, you know, compared with, say, 10 years ago, this is a big change. The obesity paradox theory may support the use of NOACs in morbidly obese patients, but we do need more data. Along those lines, measuring NOAC levels is suggested in patients with a BMI greater than 40 or weight greater than 120 kilograms, and choices are diluted thrombin time for the level of dabigatran effect and the chromogenic anti 10 a levels for pixaban, adoxaban, or rivaroxaban. So, um, you know, that's learning objective one that we've gone through. Hopefully that was useful to the audience. We've got a bunch of folks on the audience, in the audience, by the way, it's over 400 people. And there are a lot of questions coming in that are great questions, so keep them coming in. So Edith and Kaz, I'm gonna just turn to you before we move on to objective two. And uh, we've got a lot more material to cover, but there, there are just a lot of great questions. Sure. Let's at least get through some of them. So if you could just keep your answers to 30 seconds or less, that will be useful. Um, so this is a question, uh, anyone that wants it can take it, although I think it pertains to the part where you were talking, Edith, but the question is as follows. I thought rivaroxaban now has an indication for non-valvular AF and end-stage renal disease patients on dialysis. The new test queue, are you are muted. Sorry, okay. 
So not an indication per se, there's some um, additional language in the package insert um, in patients with renal impairment, but not estagional disease. In those with estagional disease and dialysis, um, the usage is still not recommended and, and um, there's not an indication. I don't know, uh, Kazu, if you wanna add anything to that. Yes, I agree that I think that that's totally agree with you that I think the official statement, you know, that even though there may be some information that data was just purely based on the single dose information in, a, in the, the dialysis patient. So it's probably it's early to tell that, you know, the rivaroxaban could be used in the dialysis patient. But for the Pixaban, that I could agree with that because, you know, guideline now added the Pixaban. Uh, to the list of the anticoagulation for dialysis patients. Yes, that's correct. It's in the apixaban label, even in dialysis patients. So there are the doses, five milligrams BID in general, correct? Yeah, that is correct. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it myself. Uh, uh, a lot of times people assume there would need to be a dosage reduction, but that's not in fact correct. All right, here's a question from Dr. Ryan in Utah. Hello, Dr. Ryan, good to hear from you. Um, and uh, this question is as follows. In the, speedy, in the speed study of rivaroxaban in obesity in AF, there is still a decrease in AUC and Cmax in high BMI. How do we take that into account when trying to decide about the risk of VTE at lower concentrations? Again, uh, any, either of you that wants to take that, please go for it. Sure, uh, I will take that because of the relevant material from my side. So I agree that you know VT population versus the AFib, that's probably another discussion that we could spend for whole one hour, but uh, just to keep it simple, <laughs> just for the VT, you know, I agree that we have limited data than the AFib. So it's probably, we have to be more cautious on using the NOAX uh, in this population for VT patients versus the non variable AFib. So that's one thing. And then now there are a couple of the retrospective data came out over the last year, but so we could keep an eye on those information and then hopefully that supports the use of the NOAX. And then even though there is some the PK variations that, you know, outcomes data is more important than the pharmacokinetic data. So if the outcome data could support the use of the fixed events or reverox event, regardless of the PK changes, we potentially could consider the use. Terrific. Uh, here's a question. I'll just take this one. Do you do CHADS VASC on all patients greater than 60? Uh, that's a great question. I'm not sure if you mean, do I do it in AFib patients over 60? There the question, the answer is yes. Uh, just because they're over 60, I wouldn't not do it. If the question is, do I do it in non-AFib patients over the age of 60? That's an interesting question. I mean, I, I tend to do CHADS VASC where I am considering anticoagulation and that's in the setting of atrial fibrillation. Having said that, there are studies, including one from the data that I alluded to here from the REACH registry, showing that the CHADS VASC uh, score actually does predict risk, even in patients without atrial fibrillation, predicts the risk of all sorts of ischemic events. So, you know, perhaps as that gets integrated into electronic health records, we'll just calculate it in everybody. Uh, it's a reasonable uh, thing to consider. Um, okay, well, there are a lot more questions here. Let me try to get through a few. Again, this is for either of you that wants to take it for obese patients. Should we use adjusted body weight in calculating creatinine clearance instead of ideal body weight? So, you know, I'll take a stab at this. I mean, this is, uh, but I very much like to hear your opinions as well. Um, you know, this is controversial, you know, a gray area um, answer um, because the data is not black and white. And so, in practice, I can tell you that, you know, in, at my institution, we tend to use adjusted body weight, but as I said, you know, uh, the data is not there for me to come out and say that's indeed, you know, what uh, we should be doing in practice. And so uh, we know that that's a little bit different than what the um, large randomized trials have done where actual body weight was used. So curious to see what you're doing at your institutions, Kazu and Dr. Bot. Yes, I think that's a... Go ahead, Dr. Burke. No, please go ahead, Catherine. So this is another gray area of the medicine. So I agree the package inserts definitely specify the actual body weight needs to be used for creatinine clearance. However, that study did not include the super morbid obese patients. So we do not you know, estimate the based on the actual body weight for this patient. So I agree with using adjusted body weight in the real world setting. 
Terrific. And maybe we'll take one more, then we've just got to keep moving here. So most institutions have anti-10A monitoring specific to low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin, but not anti-10A levels specific for NOACs. How reliable are these anti-10A labs when looking at NOAC anti-10A levels? That's a good question. Yes, so I'd probably take the question just to see. So the question was the availability of the NOAC calibrated uh, on the 10 a So I agree with that. So the most of the institution just have the heparin and the unfluctuated heparin versus the low market heparin on the 10 a So now there is a couple of studies showing the some correlations between the heparin or low market heparin on the 10 a versus the NOAC anti-10A concentrations. So therefore we could use as a qualitative assessment. However, it's too early to use for quantitative assessment. So if you wanna use the actual measurement of the level that even though it's a sent out lab, it takes three days that we, I recommend using the outside lab. So, but a qualitative assessment, there is a, some data coming up over the last few years to use the alternative the low market heparin or heparin anti a for that reason. Great answer. And it, there's you know a ton more questions about obesity, but maybe now let's turn to our second learning objective to evaluate the safety and efficacy data for NOAX and for warfarin in obese patients with non valvular AF. I think that'll answer a lot of the great questions that are coming in specific to that topic. And along those lines, Kazu, can you show us the actual data? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, as we discussed since the ISTH statement, the multiple study came out. So let me start with the post hoc analysis of the Aristotle trial, which was the river apixaban versus the warfarin. So the, there are two postdoc analysis on the left side, BMI-based subcategories versus the weight-based categories on the right side. And then just to keep in mind, about 1,000 patients were mobile obese patients based on the BMI, the Aristotle postdoc analysis, and looking at the Pixaban versus the Wolfrin, and then the primary outcome was stroke or systemic embolism, and the primary safety outcome was the ISTH major bleeding. And then the study found that there was no significant interaction between the interventions and the BMI in the primary efficacy outcome. So that means that the BMI did not affect the, the benefits of using the PIX events in the mobile obese, uh, the regardless of the BMI. And then for the safety wise, there was no significant difference in the major bleeding rate between the BMI greater than or equal to 40 and then the other BMIs. So it means that regardless of BMI, that the safety data due to the PIX7 versus the Wolfram persisted in all subgroups. And then moving on to the, the post hoc study based on the weight, and about 982 patients classified as the mobile obese patient, same interventions and then outcomes. And there was no significant interaction between the three weight cohorts for the composite end point of the stroke or systemic embolism. So to put all these study together, there seems like there was no significant difference in efficacy and then for the safety, regardless of the BMI or weight for that based on the Aristotle post hoc analysis. So how about other trials? So here is the meta-analysis conducted by one and colleagues and looking at the other clinical trials, including the Aristotle RELI, Rocket AF, Aristotle and Engage AF TIMI trial, RELI trial for the bigger trend, Rocket AF for the Rivaroxaban, Aristotle for the a PIXABAND, engage AFT me for the DOXABAND. And then for the first BMI subgroup from 30 to 35, and then there was no significant difference between the NOAC and the Wolfram in the efficacy, the stroke prevention outcome versus the use of the DOXABAND was associated with lower, significantly lower event rate of the stroke uh, compared against the Wolfram based on the 95% confidence interval. Looking at the next cohort, 35 to 39.99, the use of the PIXABAN was actually associated with a significant low event rate of the stroke compared against the Wolfram. And then there was no significant difference between the Edoxabans and the Wolfram. 
And then specifically looking at the morbid obese patient subgroups, we talked about our initial trial already. There was no significant difference in uh, efficacy stroke prevention between the warfarin and the fixaban. And then keep in mind that uh, actually the doxaban study also had a morbid obese patient included, and there was no significant difference between the doxaban and the warfarin. And then the overall result in the meta-analysis showed that the use of the NOAC was associated with significantly lower event rate of stroke compared against the warfarin. So what about the results of safety outcomes based on the BMI categories? The same BMI subgroups and the same clinical studies included. And then looking at the hazard ratio and the 95% confidence interval, there was no significant difference between the NOAC and the warfarin regardless of the BMI subgroups. And then looking at the overall result at the end, the use of the NOAC was associated with significantly lower event rate of the major bleeding compared against the warfarin and based on the 95% confidence interval did not cross one. So now we talked about the post hoc analysis of the clinical trials for the NOACs versus the warfarin. So what about the results in the real world setting? So since the ISTH statement, the three major study came out uh, on the left side, single center run retrospective cohort study. That was very small studies looking at the mobile obese patient with the atrial fibrillation based on the BMI and the weight. And then NOAX, the Pixaban, the bigger trend, or Rivaroxaban were included versus the warfarin. And the primary efficacy outcome was stroke or TIA. Safety outcome was major bleeding. And then looking at the results the, for efficacy, there was no significant differences between the NOAX and the warfarin. And then for the safety outcome, the ISTH major bleeding, there was also no significant difference between them. And then moving on to the Peterson and the colleagues, this was done based on the big data or using the national insurance claim and including the morbidly obese patient with atrial fibrillation based on the ICD calls, including the rivaroxaban versus the warfarin, the primary efficacy outcome of the ischemic stroke was systemic embolism, and the secondary outcome was major bleeding. And then looking at the results, similar to the first study, there was no significant difference between the rivaroxaban and the warfarin for the stroke prevention, and also for major bleeding, there was also no significant difference between them. And then looking at the third uh, real world studies conducted by Kushner and the colleagues, including the apixaban or rivaroxaban versus the warfarin, efficacy outcome of stroke and the safety outcome of major bleeding. For efficacy outcome stroke in the AFib cohort specifically, there was no significant difference between NOAC and the warfarin. And then looking at the safety outcomes, that there was also no significant difference, even though the the rate of the ISDH major bleeding was numerically lower in the NOAX group compared against the Wolfram group. So to consider those information, so what is the result in the meta-analysis? So here is the meta-analysis conducted by the, my colleagues and myself the, for the stroke or systemic embolism event rates. So overall result, the compared to the Wolfram groups, the NOAX use and then there was no significant difference between these two groups based on the odds ratio of 0.85 and 95% confidence interval did cross one. And then moving on to the major bleeding event rates. So similar trials included here and then overall result at the end here. And looking at the odds ratio, the 95% confidence interval, the actual the use of the NOAX was associated with significantly lower event rate of major bleeding compared against the warfarin that based on the 95% confidence interval did not cross one. So now that the, based on the real world studies, the, the NOAC use was supported uh, from the retrospective studies or post hocs of the clinical trials. So what is the larger um, the real world data in the morbid ob the obese patients, so which is the Aristophan's obesity subgroup analysis. Now for efficacy that the top of Pixaban versus the warfarin in the middle, the bigger term versus warfarin, 
and the Rivarok 7 versus Wolverine at the end. And then looking at the reference group versus the Wolverine, and the hazard ratio 0.63, and then the 95% did not cross one. So it means the Rivarok, the Pixaban use was associated with significantly lower rate of the stroke or systemic embolism compared against the Wolverine. And then looking at the Davigatron versus Wolverine, there was no significant difference between the Davigatron and the Wolverine. And then the, moving on to the last part, the rivaroxaban use was actually associated with significantly lower rate of stroke or systemic embolism compared to the Wolverine, which is different from the Rocket AF trial. So how about the results of the safety outcomes? Same format, Pixaban, Wolfering at the top, the bigger term versus the Wolfering in the middle, Rivarox 7 versus Wolfering at the end. The PIC7 use was associated with significantly lower rate of the major bleeding compared against the Wolfering. And then the GI bleeding intracranial hemorrhage showed the similar results. And then for the Dabigatron the versus the Wolfering, the use of the Dabigatron was actually associated with significantly lower rate of the major bleeding compared to the Wolfering, which is different from the relay trial showing the comparable major bleeding rates. And then the GI bleeding rate also, there was no, was no significant difference between the Vigatron versus Wolfering, which is also different from the relay trial showing the use of the Vigatron was actually higher, the higher, you know, the risk of the GI bleeding was significantly higher in the Vigatron versus the Wolfering in the relay trial. So this data was different from the relay trial and the ISTH, was, there was no significant difference. And the Rivaroxamine versus the Wolfering, um, major bleeding, there was no significant differences, but for GI bleeding, similar to the Rocket AF trial, the use of the GI bleeding risk was significantly higher in the Rivaroxaban compared against the Wolfrin, and the intracranial hemorrhage risk was significantly lower in uh, Rivaroxaban compared against the Wolfrin. Well, thank you, Kazu. That was really terrific. And congratulations to you and your colleagues on that important work that you've published. I think it's so informative to the field and it really moves us forward. There's a data void in terms of obese patients and what to do. And I think you've shed a lot of light with that work. So congratulations on that. Well, let me say a little bit about the incidence of GI bleeding. It's an important topic in real life practice. So let me at least share some data here. And this is specifically referring to upper GI bleeding risk with oral anticoagulants with or without a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, the no PPI co-therapy is shown in red and the PPI co-therapy is shown in blue. And as you can see here, across the board with the NOAX and with warfarin, there are lower rates of GI bleeding with the PPI versus without. And this is in keeping really with what common sense would support and also in keeping with some randomized trials, such as the cogent trial that I led some years ago, where it would dual antiplatelet therapy in a randomized trial, PPI was associated with less clinical GI bleeding than no PPI. So as with DAPT, also it appears to be the case here that with anticoagulation, there's a lower associated rate of GI bleeding if a PPI is prescribed. So just to conclude with learning objective two, and then we'll move on to learning objective three here and wrap up in a little bit. Analysis of phase three clinical trial data and retrospective cohort studies support the use of NOACs in morbidly obese patients with atrial fibrillation. I think it's a real conceptual advance having both subgroup data from phase three clinical trials and retrospective cohort studies that both seem to take us to the same place. Well, now we're going to move on to learning objective three, uh, which is a pretty uh, short uh, series of slides we're going to do, and then we'll get to all the questions and answers. But let me just take a couple of questions before because they're related to what was just presented, in, in particular um, by you, Kazu, right now. So while it's fresh on our audience uh, members' uh, minds, and, and the number of audience members is actually going up. It's surprising uh, that on a Sunday night, it's actually <laughs> going on. But the question to you was looking at the randomized data and the observational data that you've just reviewed, um, it's pretty clear that NOACs are better than warfarin is the question. But uh, among the NOACs, a number of people have asked which one is the best based on the data that are available now in that morbidly obese patient. 
So that's a, actually the really tough questions because there is no head to head uh, study information to justify, but just amount regarding the amount of the information available for the specific NOx, obviously as we can see the Rivarox event and the PIX event has more data than the DOX event uh, and the bigger trend. The bigger, you know, a DOX event advantage of using a DOX event is actually some populations were mobile obese patients in uh, engaged AF TIMI trials. So that'll be advantage, but the bigger trend, I couldn't see any positive data to support. So, you know, just uh, to simply put the Rivarox event, PIX event potentially would be, you know, supported uh, by the evidence because of the amount of the information, but it's hard to show the superiority one over the others. Yeah, no, really in the absence of head-to-head -head trials, everything we say is, is rather speculative. Rivaroxaban, of course, has the advantage of once a day, Apixaban's twice a day. On the other hand, if one looks at the Apixaban trials, even the data you showed, you know, there, if anything, things like GI bleeding don't seem to be increased worse than for with, with Rivaroxaban, we have seen signals of increased GI bleeding. That's uh, actually a really great point. Yeah, and, and that can include lower GI bleeding, even though I was talking about ways to reduce upper GI bleeding with proton pump inhibition. So e even if one just looks at the overall randomized clinical trials, uh, you know, perhaps that twice a day dosing, while in some patients could be an issue with lower adherence, in those who are adherent to it, you know, might be an advantage in perhaps preventing the, the higher peaks that might be associated with provoking some bleeding episodes. But at any rate, we can debate that in our panel discussion. Now let's move on to our third and final learning objective, and that's how to counsel obese patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation on the risks and benefits of NOACs and of warfarin as well to optimize adherence and health outcomes. To start off this discussion, Kazu, can you walk us through a situation that a pharmacist might encounter in real life? Yes, absolutely. So here is a case, the 74 years old male with a past medical history of the atrial fibrillation who came to the cardiology multidisciplinary clinic for the regular follow-up. And as an ambulatory care pharmacist, you're reviewing the, his medication regimen prior to the physician's appointment. And he's morbidly obese based on the BMI and weight. And he's currently on the bigger trend, 150 milligram twice a day for the atrial fibrillations. And his lab was significant for the serum creatinine 1.5 and estimated creatinine clearance is about 30. And then he also to told the pharmacist, uh, he, stated, uh, he started taking the St. John's Ward for depression, which was recommended by the primary care doctor two months ago. And then he also told the pharmacist that he doesn't know why he needs to stay on the bigger trends. And he feels that he has no, the medication does not give him the, any values. And he often forgets to take it about at least one or two times weekly. So the, based on that question, the case, the, what should the pharmacist do in this scenario? And then, First one is the recommending switching from the bigger trend to a PIX event based on the mobile OB status or his renal functions. And the second option is the recommend stopping St. John's Ward to avoid drug interaction with NOAX. And the third option is counsel patients on the indication of anticoagulation to improve the adherence for AFib. And then risk of the abrupt NOAX discontinuation should be discussed with the patients. And then the fourth answer is all of our verb. And the fifth answer is the I don't know. So we have our results. So Dr. Bert and then Dr. Nutescu, they're based on the response. To what did you guys all think? I, I don't think the response um, is surprising. 81% uh, of the audience picks option uh, for all of the above. Uh, of course, you know, this case has several facets. There are issues of adherence. Um, there are um, issues of drug interactions. Um, uh, patients not particularly keen with the current anticoagulant, of course, you know, education uh, on the importance of adherence and consequences of non-adherence would have to be discussed. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I, I mean, I, I would have picked number one, that is, I would have recommended switching from dabigatran to something uh, and probably a pixaban uh, due to the morbid obesity and also the renal function. You know, I think number two, recommend stopping St. John's Ward. It's going to be tough. The patient may not like that answer, may not do it. So it may not matter what I think. 
uh, in that respect. And you know, counseling on anticoagulation and the risk of uh, stopping uh, anticoagulation, that's always a good thing to do. So I, I guess of the choices, I would have probably gone with one, but I can see that you know, it's like real life. It can be uh, a little bit messy and, and things aren't always so clear. So maybe Edith, uh, you can take us through another case, another real life case with real life challenges. Absolutely. So what we have here is a 65 year old African-American woman who has uncontrolled hypertension, diabetes, chronic renal insufficiency, clearance of 35, and hyperlipidemia. She comes to the ED with dizziness and palpitations. EKG shows AF at a rate of 110. Um, exam otherwise normal, labs otherwise within normal limits. We've already noted her creatinine, creatinine clearance. You can see her BMI is at 47. Her concurrent medications, important to note, as, as we'll see, there's some that hit the drug interaction list uh, with some of the anticoagulants. Um, social history, positive for two to three drinks per day. Um, she's a widower who lives uh, quite um, uh, afar, about 30 miles from the nearest clinic. She has limited dexterity as well as trouble with transportation because she does not drive. She has Medicare Part D coverage, but is concerned about a high copay on her medications, which she can't afford. On top of it, she's forgetful and ex expresses a preference for medications that she can take once a day, as all her other current medications can be taken once daily. So this is a comp complex case and um, really not uh, that unusual to what we see in an inner city, large academic uh, hospital where 60% um, of our population is African-American, about 20% Hispanic, 20% everybody else. Um, but let's look at, um, uh, check in with our audience uh, again. And so the question I would like you to consider here is that this patient presents to you with a prescription for warfarin, five milligrams daily. And what is your recommendation in this scenario? If you could please vote now. And so the options are A, fill her warfarin as prescribed, uh, discuss selection, uh, B would be discuss selection of therapy with the patient and the prescribing uh, provider, C recommend switching the patient to a Pixabam, give her her weight and renal function, um, D unsure, Okay, so very interesting results about 50% pick option uh, two discussed with the prescribing provider. The next biggest category, 35% recommend switching to a NOAC, in this case, a Pixabam. Um, but I would like to um, turn this now to Dr. Bott and um, uh, Dr. Keto, and so get your uh, perspective on, on the answers here. Well, again, I think it's a tough question. It's real life. I guess I would have probably picked number three, that is recommending switching the patient to Pixaban given her weight and renal function. I don't think that uh, number two is a mistake to ever discuss the selection of therapy with the patient, the prescribing MD. I mean, to me, that's one of those answers uh, that's always correct. I think number four is also correct. Nothing wrong with being unsure in life. I, I probably wouldn't just go fill the warfarin as prescribed, though. That one I probably wouldn't have done. So uh, myself, I would have gone with number three, switching her to a Pixaban, uh, given the weight and renal function and the data we reviewed. But I'd be interested in what Kazo has to say. Yes, I agree with the uh, Dr. Bart and uh, you know Dr. Nutescu. So, so definitely the warfarin may be tough based on the access to the INRs and then uh, based on the non-compliance history. You know, even though patients you know could check the INR, could you know see the how the compliant patient is, but definitely the you know once we counsel patients on the NOACs, patient could recognize the you know pros of using the NOACs, and patient have better understanding. And then that counseling part may help improve then and then you know recognize the benefit of using NOAC. So if patient could get some like a patient assistance program, that might also help. But for the reason I agree with choosing three. Great, thank you. Well, Edith, do you want to go on? Yes. So as we've seen in our patient case, um, there are a number of clinical considerations to sort through when individualizing selection of anticoagulation therapy, uh, such as indication, of course, stroke risk. So weighing stroke risk versus bleeding risk as already highlighted um, by Dr. Bott earlier in the presentation, 
drug interactions, weight, renal function, age, side effects, adherence, access to drugs, of course, medication costs, co-pays, and last but not least, very important, patient preferences. So a systematic approach to considering each factor that influences therapy can assist with the selection of the most appropriate and individualized anticoagulant therapy for each patient. Lack of considering patient-specific factors and not individualizing therapy can lead to high rates of therapy switching and or discontinuation, as seen here on this slide. This is a study actually conducted by our group here at UIC. Um, in fact, the first author is one of my um, uh, former PhD students. Um, this now has published, uh, has been published several years ago, but still very relevant in terms of results to our discussion today. So in a cohort of over 34,000 patients, um, uh, anticoagulation naive patients with AF were newly initiated on NOAC therapy. What we've seen here is that one in five patients switched to an alternate anticoagulant, and one of every two patients did so within the first six months of therapy. So you could see these on my left-hand side of the graph, um, so left graph. While early switching over the initial six months from NOAC to warfarin was more common, this is depicted on my right-hand side, Switching from an initial NOAC prescription to warfarin occurs as frequently as switching to an alternate NOAC over the study period. In another um, large real world study looking at over 40,000 patients, we've seen similar results in that treatment persistence decreases over time, and we're seeing discontinuation of therapy increasing over time from three months to 12 months of therapy. More significant with some agents such as warfarin and the bigotran, but an overall decrease over time is noted here with all the anticoagulant agents. Now yet in another study, uh, again from our group, the same graduate student is the lead author in a cohort of over 66,000 patients now with AF, um, of which about half were anticoag naive and half were experienced on anticoagulation therapy. So when they came into our study, they were already on anticoagulant therapy. We found that persistence with NOAX declined over time and both were suboptimal and lower in anticoag naive compared to anticoag experienced patients. These findings indicate the importance of interventions for patient education and long-term anticoagulant management especially in those patients as depicted here who are naive to NOAC therapy. Now, one other important factor to consider in selecting the most effective and safe therapy in those at highest risk of complication due to AF is the risk assessment and anticoagulant therapy selection in minority patients. As illustrated on this slide, uh, minority patients with AF who are at risk of stroke were less likely to receive any oral anticoagulant and NOAC specifically when compared to whites. And this was even after accounting for confounders such as insurance status, income, and stroke risk factors. Now, I think we can all agree that pharmacists play an important role in the care of patients with atrial fibrillation. Pharmacist involvement in anticoag management has been demonstrated to show improved adherence rates, reduction in side effects associated with anticoagulant therapy, and decrease in rates of anticoag-related ED visits and hospitalizations. And as you could see here in this graph, what we're showing you here basically is the effect of pharmacy-provided anticoagulant ed education on 60-day hospital readmissions. And so both overall readmissions, but most importantly, um, readmissions related to anticoagulant events or anticoagulant-related events were significantly lower in those patients who have received education by the pharmacist. Now, specific pharmacist intervention, again, to, to further illustrate this point, in this study published in JAMA back in 2015, we learned that specific pharmacist interventions are associated with greater NOAC patient adherence. So looking at um, guiding patient selection, patient education, 
and monitoring, but monitoring over a longer duration of period over 12 months and providing more intensive care to non-adherent patients improved adherence. Now, what are some of the factors that influence patient adherence? Um, and not to interrupt for this really important part about adherence, but uh, we've got about 10 minutes before wrapping up the whole program. So just to help you with yourself. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt. And the last few slides we can go through fairly quickly. Um, uh, these are slides that our pharmacist audience is, is very familiar with. And so, of course, you know, we have to consider patient-centered factors, therapy-related factors, um, healthcare system factors, and last but not least, social and economic factors. Now, pharmacists play a major role, of course, in collaborative therapy uh, decision-making. Um, starting with estimating benefit risk, of course, um, stroke risk and major bleeding risk, selection of appropriate candidates, recommending appropriate therapy, communicating with the team and the patients, and then last but not least, educating the patient. So all of these things, you know, that have come up in some of the patient cases we've discussed, but um, more so in the third patient case, right, the importance of highlighting all of these patient-related and system-related factors. Now, patient-centered education is also uh, supported and in fact required by regulatory bodies such as the Joint Commission. And if, just in interest of time, if we could jump on to the next slide, um, this uh, brings up the importance of shared decision-making. Of course, not only because of um, not sufficient patients who are at risk to receive therapy, but also of those who start therapy, a high percent stop treatment over the first 12 months. And we've shown you data uh, regarding this. And so because of these data, um, AHA, ACC, HRS guidelines note that your decision-making can improve adherence to anticoagulant therapy. Next slide shows you specific patient preferences to denote that considering patient preferences, individualizing therapy is critical. Patients put weight on stroke risk, safety, major bleeding, other side effects, but also conveniences such as dosing frequency, antidote availability, um, again, other conveniences such as taking with or without food and dietary restrictions. And I think this brings me um, next to my last slide then, of course, just showing you some examples of shared decision-making. Many are out there, but the one that I personally like is this one put out by Mayo Clinic. Um, this shows you an example of a patient with a CHADS VAS score of three. The left-hand side here, you see very nicely depicted um, the risk of stroke. Uh, people who will um, have a non-disabling stroke in orange color, uh, the lavender color, those who will have a fetal or disabling stroke, and then the green um, dots show people who will have no stroke if they're not an anticoagulant. To the right of it, what you see is if a patient's placed on anticoagulant, what is the benefit? And so this is very, very nice in terms of graphics on how we can best relay this type of information to patients. And then um, this Mayo program is also nice because it also has an education module. Uh, this is to the far right of the slide and you can see some of the topics here depicted that you can discuss with the patient. And this brings, back, um, brings me back to uh, my last slide uh, to summarize then uh, some of the points that we've seen in our patient in the last case. Several patient-specific factors need to be considered when selecting oral anticoagulation for patients. Thrombosis and bleeding risk, weight, renal function, age, concurrent drug therapy, of course, patient preferences, costs are critical. So of course, individualizing therapy, uh, clinical decision support tools can aid in treatment selection and patient education. And of course, last but not least, the systematic approach to screening and discussing drug selection is vital for selection of the best agent, but individualized treatment for each patient. And with that, I think Dr. Bhatt, I'm going to give it back to you. Edith, that was just excellent. Thank you so much for that presentation. And you know, it's interesting you're talking about that important topic of adherence and I'm telling you to cut it short. I mean, that's what happens in real life. We just don't focus on adherence as much as we ought to. It's such an important topic that it often gets short trip. I do wanna make our audience aware of another tool that you can use in practice. 
which is a patient education whiteboard video that can be found on the CME Outfitters website in the Cardiology Hub. So please take time to review the video and share it with your patients. It's one of the many resources that you can find on the CME Outfitters website. So at this point, let's wrap up by reviewing SMART goals that you can carry into your practice. Select appropriate anticoagulation at the appropriate dose. Utilize a systematic approach to screening, individualized treatment selection. Don't underestimate the risk of under-treatment. Consider measuring NOAC levels and morbidly obese patients where appropriate, where appropriate, and that would be the diluted thrombin time for dabigatran and the chromogenic antitinae levels for pixaban, adoxaban, and rivaroxaban. Apply clinical study findings of NOACs and warfarin in obese patients where they have to appropriate patients in your practice, engage patients in SDM, and reinforce the importance of adherence and persistence. So go ahead now and ask a question. Actually, a lot of folks have already asked a question, but please keep submitting them. We've got about seven minutes left, and we're going to use all that time to get through as much as we can. You can use the Q&A widget on your screen, uh, and you can email questions to at cmeoutfitters.com, or you can even tweet us. I've been following along. I actually just saw Dr. Natescu in action on the live Twitter feed. It was really fun seeing her on the one Zoom screen on the other uh, Twitter feed. But uh, let's jump in right now and uh, let's get through some of the questions. And then at the end, I've got to do a few housekeeping things. We have to save a couple of minutes for that. So let me start off with you, Edith. You were talking about many important things there, adherence and so forth. You were also talking about disparities in care. This question states, uh, from the questioner, uh, an African-American woman was prescribed warfarin. Uh, how do you use patient copay reduction assistance when it is specifically prohibited by Medicare Part D? That's why I would most likely have to go with warfarin if she had limited financial means. So excellent point. And uh, the case that we've discussed intentionally was complex. And I must confess, you know, there was not a single correct answer, right? So the correct answer was think about the combination of the various options and probably more. And so you're absolutely right on Medicare Part D, but here the options would be certain agents, you know, um, would have a preferred status versus others who would not under different insurers. And so copays might be lower for some agents versus others. Uh, could there be coinsurance in this case? Again, all of this information has not been provided. Now, obviously, if there's no coinsurance, and all the copays are, let's say, $100 or higher, or you know, tremendously high, and this patient cannot afford, and clearly then the option would be warfarin, right? But the point of this case was to really think about all that we need to consider. Um, some of the barriers, of course, you know, she cannot come in for monitoring. What do we do with a patient like this? Then if she can't afford something, and let's say the copay is high, there's no alternate options, like a patient assistance program or anything else that could be used self-testing, home monitoring, right? You know, so there are other options if she must stay on warfarin. So um, a lot more, right, you know, to discuss here, but but excellent point. And so um, again, looking at tier of coverage, a patient assistance programs, if all of that fails, then obviously we'll have to stick with something that the patient can afford and would take, would be adherent with. Terrific answer. All right, there's about, uh, about 50 other questions. I'll try to lump them together. And if you could each keep your responses to no more than 15 to 30 seconds. What sure. advice do you have for patients on a NOAC who are initiated on a new therapy that is a strong CYP3A4 inducer? For example, St. John's wort is a potent CYP3A4 inducer. We've discussed that a little bit already. And so are several agents used in oncology, such as enzalutamide, which could reduce levels of NOAC, anticoagulant levels. Should NOACs be avoided with this drug interaction? So I'd like to hear Kazu's uh, point of view here too. You know, my personal approach here would be, you know, so if we if we think of switching a NOAC, then the alternative here would be warfarin. And for those of you that have managed warfarin in an oncology patient, you know what a nightmare that is, and it's not an easy task, right, uh, to maintain satisfactory anticoagulant levels. My preference here would be to try to switch the St. John's ward and so remove the interacting drug versus um, perhaps introduce another layer of complexity in this patient's case. Okay, that's a terrific answer. Let me move on to the next question. Maybe I'll take this one. 
Uh, this has to do with whether it's okay to use NOAX in bioprosthetic valves and atrial fibrillation. This is a terrific and timely question. I would refer you to the New England Journal of Medicine. The River study was just published there. It looked at AFib with a bioprosthetic mitral valve. The specific NOAC study there was rivaroxaban. It looked terrific. Um, in fact, uh, in many metrics, whether the p-values hit or not, it actually looked better. So I would say bioprosthetic valve, otherwise a good candidate for NOAC, no contraindications. At the present time, I would do it uh, over warfarin. All right, uh, here are a bunch of questions about uh, factor 10A levels and so forth. Um, the questions have to do with whether you can use factor 10A levels. Can you monitor them uh, in obese patients? Uh, we've already said, yes, you can. What if you can't monitor 10A levels? Is it still okay to use a Pixaban in obese patients? So that's actually the great question. So, you know, availability of the anti 10 level is always the issue. So just, uh, you know, to simply put, so, you know, based on the result, I think this is just if, you know, we need to have a discussion with the patients, but, you know, based on what we have for the retrospective data of post hoc analysis of clinical trial, but if we, you know, pursue the routes that, you know, the level, you know, definitely that is still, uh, ideal to check it, but if not, you know, rivaroxaban seems like had a consistently better PK profile. So that might be the option to consider, you know, based on that, but we have to disclose the information to patients, see that if that's okay or not. And then, you know, since the ASTH statement, you know, still says checking levels. And what would you do is another related question. Would you adjust dosing of NOAX based on the level? And if so, how? So we do not have the therapeutic range yet. Not that, you know, we only have expected range. So for the reason, a dose adjustment will be risky. And then based on Dr. Bart and talked about for the underdosing concern. So for the reason, probably no adjustment is probably still required for that based on the level until we have more data. And Edith, this question is to you, 15 seconds. Is there a significant difference in efficacy of rivaroxaban if it is administered with evening versus morning meal? You know, I must say I'm not aware of such data. Um, you know, my understanding is that it's the content of the food. And so apparently fatty foods would lead to better bioavailability. Yes, no, that's correct. I think the nighttime is sort of a historical uh, sort of remnant for morphine, which was typically given at nights. All right, well, I think that's about all time we have for Q&A. To receive CME CE credit for today's program, click on the Evaluations tab to complete the post-test and print your certificate. Also, please check out our Cardiology Hub that contains resources we've selected for you and for your patients. And for more activities that offer ACPE credit, please check out the Virtual Education Hub where you'll find programs across a variety of therapeutic areas. Thank you again for participating and thank you for providing the best care for your patients. And really thank you to both the faculty members, Dr. Nutesu and Dr. Keto for outstanding presentations and discussions. Everyone have a great night. Thank you.